Right now on this Denver 7 special report, protecting our planet. As we celebrate Earth Day, we look at how our pandemic behaviors changed our planet for the better. Once we saw pretty drastic decreases in certain air pollutants. Plus, what can we expect following Colorado's worst wildfire season in history? These trends in the drought are not anomalies. They're really a harbinger of the future. Why so many of the world's best hurricane forecasters live so far from the ocean and an inconvenient brew. It's a smoky rain water. We taste what Colorado beer could taste like in a climate ravaged world. Welcome to this Denver 7 Earth Day special report. Over the next half hour, we'll be tackling climate change from multiple angles. We'll explore how long lasting drought conditions across the western U.S. could change Colorado's climate, how higher demand for water from the Colorado River could lead to long term water restrictions in Colorado and beyond, why CSU researchers are predicting another active hurricane season in the Atlantic, and what companies are doing to prepare for change to their business models due to climate change. But we begin tonight with a look at the past year, specifically how the coronavirus pandemic changed our daily lives and how those changes benefited the environment. Here's Maya Rodriguez. Clear skies, cleaner air, and even the simple sounds of more birds chirping. All hallmarks of the first year of COVID-19 when fewer people were out and about. Nature is, is very resilient and uh, nature is, 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 is waiting in that space to, uh, to blossom. Rachel Cletus with the Union of Concerned Scientists says the past year taught us a lot about our environment and the possibilities to improve it. What became very clear is that human beings uh, have an outsized footprint on our planet. Among the biggest early changes, air quality, thanks to industries operating at lower outputs and fewer vehicles on the road. Once we saw pretty drastic decreases in certain air pollutants, especially air pollutants that were caused by traffic and transportation. But Gage Kerr, an air pollution expert with George Washington University, says that's starting to change again and not for the better. The pollution levels have more or less rebounded back to pre-pandemic levels. One change that scientists say may have a longer lasting impact, people's appreciation for the outdoors and green spaces like parks. I think the pandemic's taught us a lot of things and one of them might be the ability to have green spaces for exercise to get out of our houses when we're cooped up. Another impact from COVID, the health of the world's oceans. When the lockdowns happened, many seafood restaurants closed and all over the globe, the demand for seafood plummeted. Because of that, some marine life began to emerge in the ocean. People spotting it in places where it wasn't usually seen. But those gains came with a cost. Oxfam, for example, was looking at hunger and poverty around the world and just sounding the alarm that many, many people were being driven uh, into desperate situations. Which is why scientists and researchers are now studying the past COVID year to figure out how to make some of these environmental improvements last while not harming how people make a living. Question is, can we make the kinds of policies and investments that will allow us to grab the best of what we saw in this last year and leave behind the parts that were inequitable and harsh? This COVID-19 natural experiment is going to keep scientists busy for months and maybe even years. In the hopes that future Earth Days are a bit brighter. I'm Maya Rodriguez. We turn now to one of the most noticeable impacts of climate change in Colorado, wildfires. 2020 was our state's worst year for wildfires in history. More than 6,700 fires were reported and nearly three quarters of a million acres of land burned. Three of those fires were large enough to overtake the 2002 Hayman fire on Colorado's list of largest wildfires. The Cameron Peak fire is now Colorado's largest wildfire in history, having burned nearly 209,000 acres last year. The East Troublesome Fire comes in second at more than 192,000 acres burned. And the Pine Gulch Fire burned just over 139,000 acres near Grand Junction. Fire managers believe this could be a trend that continues in the coming years. I, I would like to say they're anomalies, but I'm not convinced that they really are. But to see that kind of fire behavior um, really kind of sets you back on your heels to go, this is... Uh, 
This is a significant challenge to firefighters. All 20 of our state's largest wildfires have happened since 2001, including nine from just the past three years. Colorado's wildfire outlook isn't looking any better for our future. The Colorado Division of Fire Prevention and Control predicts increasing drought conditions over the coming years could make 2020 look less like a high fire season and more like a standard one. Since 19, the 1970s, our fire seasons have expanded and they're over 78 days longer. Um, we're having fire years, not fire seasons anymore. Last year, lawmakers at the state capitol approved additional spending to bolster Colorado's firefighting efforts. With that funding, the state extended contracts for firefighting helicopters to cover more of the year and approved the purchase of a Firehawk helicopter that will be ready for 2022. This year, Colorado will operate at least two multi-mission aircraft, two single-engine air tankers, and one large air tanker. All of that equipment will come in handy until Colorado's drought can improve. Here's Denver 7 Chief Meteorologist Mike Nelson with a look at the current conditions and what they mean for our state's climate. Our world is getting warmer, and with warmer conditions, it's likely to see more extreme drought across western sections of the United States as we are distant from any oceans. And the reason we're getting warmer is when carbon dioxide from the burning of fossil fuels, it remains in the atmosphere for a long time, and each molecule of CO2 acts like a feather in a down comforter, trapping heat that would otherwise escape into outer space. And that means the planet is slowly warming up. As a matter of fact, the carbon dioxide that is in the atmosphere from the gallon of gas burned in a Model T Ford will remain in the atmosphere for decades, if not centuries to come. So since the beginning of the industrial age, we've added so much more of that carbon dioxide. We see it in shrinking Arctic ice, intense hurricanes, heat waves and droughts, and of course the record setting wildfires. We're getting more hot days in the Denver area since 1970, about 15 more days of 95 or above. And along with that, as we saw last summer, that means hotter and drier conditions can mean more major fires. Now there are a lot of parts to that, including forestry practices, uh, but it does certainly with hotter weather lead to more big fires. We see the statistics, these graphics from Climate Central. And as we saw last year, the amount of smoke in the atmosphere and climate change will make its way of more of those very smoky days from western wildfires. Our drought conditions continue to be quite severe, especially western Colorado into Utah, where exceptional drought continues. And unfortunately, our 90-day outlook into the hot season does not look great for that. Warmer than average conditions expected and drier than average conditions expected. I have a new book out about climate change called The World's Littlest Book on Climate is available from Amazon.com. If you'd like to learn more, it's 10 facts in 10 minutes about carbon dioxide. Long-lasting drought conditions in the western U.S. could lead to some big water cutbacks in the coming years. The Colorado River is a source of water for millions of people in seven states, including Colorado. But its largest reservoirs are expected to hit record low water levels later this year. At Lake Powell in Utah, water levels have fallen to 36 percent capacity and could reach as low as 31 percent in the coming months. Not only is it dry, but this is the second dry year that we've seen in a row. The levels that we're projected to reach haven't been seen since it started filling in 1969. Even as water levels fall, demand for water from the Colorado River remains high. Nearly five and a half trillion gallons of water are pulled from it each year to supply drinking water to Arizona, California, Colorado, Nevada, New Mexico, Utah, and Wyoming. That's around a trillion gallons more than what flows through the river each year. So if this trend continues, some areas will see a significant reduction in water deliveries next year. Up next on this Denver 7 special report, a message that's hard to swallow. It tastes terrible. We head to one of the world's most sustainable breweries to taste how climate change could impact Colorado's beer industry. Some companies are already looking ahead to adjustments they may have to make due to climate change. This year, Fort Collins-based New Belgium Brewing released a new brew they're calling Torched Earth. It was created using only ingredients that could survive on a climate-ravaged planet. And it can leave a bitter taste in your mouth. That's kind of the point. 
These taps in Fort Collins usually run full of deliciousness. Yes, we don't set out to make bad beer. This is our one exception, I think, in the history of New Belgium. A beer released especially for Earth Day. We've used ingredients that will be more common in a future that's impacted by climate change. Smoke-tainted water, we have smoke-tainted hops that are part of this. We're using different drought-resistant grains that we think will be what's available as we look out 20 to 30 years. It's called torched earth. It's a smoky grain water. And as you can imagine, it tastes terrible. That's on purpose. It's really not meant to be enjoyed. What this beer does is it invites a conversation and, and we hope in a lot of ways it drives a conversation. A conversation about climate change. Let more people understand what the future of beer, but unfortunately the future of many things within our lives is going to be like if we don't address climate change and address it rapidly. The new Belgium brewery plans to be carbon neutral themselves by 2030 and hopes this bad beer pushes other people and companies to do the same. And we hope that our voice further pushes this movement forward and does so in a very rapid manner so that we can hit the goals and targets that we'd like to be able to achieve, that we know from science we need to be able to achieve. Consumers are becoming much more conscious of their own carbon footprint. And that's why some companies are now putting that information right on their labels. Being able to put a carbon footprint label allows a consumer to be able to have that, that, that sense, that, that, that sense of mind of, what should I be thinking about when I am buying? What should I be thinking about when I'm recycling? And what should I be thinking about as I'm using the product? One of the largest companies to announce plans for carbon footprint labeling is Unilever. Their 70,000 products include soaps, health and beauty products, food and beverages. The company hopes that by including the information, it can stand out in a crowded marketplace. Just even the, the, the presence of a carbon footprint label on Unilever products in the absence of it on their competitors' products will start to have consumers you know, start to question and, and ask why can't they see this information for the, the other comparative products that they're looking uh, to be able to buy. Unilever says the process of tracking down carbon emissions from their products will take some time. The company started the process last June and is still working on sourcing information from its suppliers, specifically on the raw ingredients they use. Up next on this Denver 7 Special Report, Colorado's role in forecasting the weather. As many Coloradans know, the weather here gets a little bit wild. Stick around for predictions from researchers at Colorado State University for this year's hurricane season. It may be strange to have hurricane forecasts coming from somewhere so far from the ocean, but researchers at Colorado State are some of the best in the world at what they do. This year, they predict an active Atlantic hurricane season with 17 named storms and eight total hurricanes, including four potential major ones. It's not a huge leap here. We're not, you know, coming out and calling for last season to repeat itself. But uh, what we are saying is that the signals are there that this could be an active season and it never hurts to have your guard up even maybe a little higher. A lot of top weather minds are actually stationed here in Colorado because of the changes happening in our weather. Chief Meteorologist Mike Nelson explains. So the annual forecast of hurricane activity has come off from Colorado State University, and it begs the question, why here high in the Rockies are we focused on hurricanes? Well, Dr. Bill Gray, the late Dr. Gray, up at Colorado State University's Atmospheric Science Department, really started doing these studies back in the mid-80s, and he said, hey, when you're a mile above sea level, you don't have to worry about the storm surge. But they are very, very good up at CSU, and some of the top tropical meteorology scientists in the world do their forecasting there. So let's go out to the world and show you the Atlantic. The main things that they focus on, obviously one of the key ingredients for tropical storm activity and hurricanes is the sea surface temperatures. This time of year, they're still quite cool down across the Gulf of Mexico and out where the Gulf Stream is off the coast of the United States. But that very warm water is one of the key things they look at to forecast how much activity we'll have. And it looks like we're going to have a lot of warm water out there as we get into hurricane season starting really the end of May and continued all the way through the end of November. So another thing is the tropical cyclone energy, a combination of the heat and the moisture. That has to do with storms that actually form in Africa and how much moisture you get there. Remember, at lower latitudes, the, the primary driving winds are not from west to east, but actually go from east to west. That's why we watch the coast of Africa for storm development when we get into hurricane season. So that is also adding in to this play for more active season. 
But if you have a lot more dust that blows off the Sahara, that actually can cause a cooling and means fewer storms. So these are some of the parts that work into the Atlantic equation on tropical activity. But the world's a big place. And actually, we have to look not only at the Atlantic, but the Pacific plays a role. You hear we talk about the uh, El Nino and La Nina. Well, the El Nino conditions are when we have warmer water in the Pacific. That adds a lot of thunderstorms and energy into the atmosphere, not only in the Pacific, but it also changes the way the jet stream flows. And very often when we have an El Nino year, warmer water in the Pacific increases the vertical wind shear all the way into the Atlantic, and that decreases tropical activity because of El Nino conditions. Well, we have actually been coming off more of a La Nina condition, and that is less vertical wind shear and tends to increase that tropical activity. So all these things come together. If you go, and we have some links to the Colorado State University's Atmospheric Sciences Department website, you can read a whole lot more about what they look at. Now, a couple other things. As we get a warmer world with global warming, we are seeing the Atlantic hurricane season water temperatures increasing of course, warmer water, more energy, and with that, we're seeing more storms coming as major storms. We certainly saw that last year, and unfortunately, at least according to the Colorado State University forecast, we may be seeing that again coming up this hurricane season. Coming up on this Denver 7 special report, preventing damage to our delicate ecosystem. Either plants are going to die, which is going to affect the animals, or insects are going to die, which is again going to affect the animals. We examine how rising sea levels from melting ice caps could affect the U.S. coastline, what people are trying to do about it. Google is making it easier for everyone to see the true impact of climate change. The company added a new feature last week that shows a time lapse of the past 37 years. The feature is a compilation of a staggering 24 million satellite photos taken from 1984 to 2020, pieced together in a time lapse video. Users can search for any area of the planet, finding photo evidence of melting ice caps, receding glaciers, urban growth, and rising sea levels. There really is no part of the world that hasn't felt the impact of climate change. Many communities are doing what they can to manage the effects right now with varying degrees of success. Chris Conti shows us some of the ideas that are working. All right, so my little darlings, let's get going. An unparalleled landscape of exceptional beauty. Florida Everglades are an international treasure. You're in the Everglades National Park. Wow. Is this not just beautiful? But it is not the alligators lurking just below the surface here that keeps Cat Britt up at night. Hello, Mr. Jumper. We got so badly flooded. So all this water is still here from that. Three decades as a tour guide in South Florida, Cat has weathered plenty of storms. It's the constant threat of climate change, though, that is threatening her way of life. It affects everything. At 1.5 million acres, the Everglades are primarily a freshwater habitat. Rising sea levels are changing that as more salt water is invading this ecosystem. You don't want the salt water encroaching on the fresh water. You don't want too much fresh water in the salt water. It's such a distinctive ecosystem. As a researcher at Florida International University, Evelyn Geyser has committed most of her life to studying the Everglades research that these days is more critical than ever. This is definitely not just a Florida problem. It's wetlands all over the world. For thousands of years, sea levels have remained relatively stable, but now Earth's seas are rising because of global warming. In the last 20 years, sea levels have risen more than two inches. It absolutely is the front lines of climate change here in the Everglades. What that means is water from the Atlantic Ocean and nearby Miami isn't just invading the Everglades through the proverbial front door. In a sense, it's sneaking in through the back. The main effect in the Everglades is actually happening below ground. Beneath the Earth's surface, salt water is seeping in through the aquifer here. For centuries, that was fresh water. Salt concentration levels, though, are exponentially higher than they were 20 years ago. Animals and plants are cornered. They retreated as far inland as possible. And there's no place left to go. We are ground zero for effects of climate change. We have been thinking about it and trying to address it in novel ways. The techniques they're using to manage climate change here in the Everglades are being used as blueprints for other cities and states across the country. Humans are also feeling the impacts. Nine million Floridians depend on the Everglades for their drinking water, 
which is why the state has spent more than $23 billion on Everglades restoration projects. Everything from elevating roadways here so fresh water can move around more freely to regulating how much water flows back into the ocean through a complex set of canals. I believe that people should pay attention to it because it may turn out to be an example of how to address a global problem as it's occurring. Florida can't afford to wait any longer to manage the effects of climate change. Either plants are going to die, which is going to affect the animals, or insects are going to die, which is again going to affect the animals. <laughs> With her industry and her livelihood at stake. Six to six and a half foot long alligator. Cat Britt is just hoping it's not too late to preserve this place she calls home. Everything is balanced. And if you upset that balance, something's got to give. In the Florida Everglades, I'm Chris Conti. Thanks so much for watching this Denver 7 special report. You can find more news and weather content anytime on the DenverChannel.com. Good night.